Okay, welcome everybody to today's edition of our webinar on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Uh, we have two fantastic speakers today and both agreed to recording. Uh, so we will record uh, and upload it to the ICMRBS YouTube channel. Uh, just a reminder everybody, don't use the chat, but use, do use the Q&A box uh, to put your questions and you may do so already during the presentations or you raise your hand and we unmute you, then you can speak directly. And also a reminder for the early career researcher uh, webinar of the ISMRBS uh, on NMR. So without further ado, then I hand over to uh, the first introducer, which is Ed Bex, and which will introduce Mike Summers. Uh, thanks, Marcus. It's a uh, particular uh, pleasure to introduce today's first uh, lecture by Michael Summers. Uh, Mike holds the title of Distinguished University Professor at the University of Maryland, UMBC. He's also a Howard Hughes investigator, which is a very uh, prestigious uh, kind of uh, thing here in the United States. Um, he's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, and he's also the Meyerhof Chair at uh, UMBC. Uh, those of you who don't know the, the Meyerhof Program, um, it is a program that is uh, targeted to um, training of underrepresented minorities and uh, Mike has played a key role in that program and he's got every reason to be very proud of that. He, his own group has trained and educated and gotten more uh, students, undergraduate students into a PhD or a medical degree program than all of the Ivy League uh, universities combined in the United States on a yearly basis and keeps on doing that. So it's really been an incredibly successful effort and it's incredible to see uh, what kind of results he is getting with working with undergraduate students mostly. Um, so we're all a little bit jealous of seeing how he's managed to, uh, to pull that off. Now, a little bit about Mike's history. I had the pleasure of uh, hosting him in my group back in the 1980s when he developed the HMBC experiment working on coenzyme B12, and any of you who've done any organic NMR have probably bumped into this HMBC experiment and many other uh, neat little things that uh, and bigger things that he did uh, when he was in my group. Uh, there are other reasons to be uh, jealous of Mike. Uh, I think he has discovered the fountain of eternal youth uh, until, he, until his 55th uh, birthday. He never was able to buy a beer here in the United States without showing his driver's license that he was over the uh, age of 21. Um, Mike is also an avid uh, mountain biker and skier, and he challenges uh, the students, now almost 40 years younger than he is, um, on a regular basis. So if you uh, are looking for uh, uh, joining his group, be prepared and do some advanced exercise. Uh, it's been an uh, incredible stimulating experience, apparently, for many, although not all of them have escaped without bumps and bruises and an occasional broken bone. Uh, Mike, we're looking forward to your uh, lecture. Well, thank you so much, Ad. Um, yeah, actually, some of the students now are more than 40 years younger, so uh, yeah, time flies. Um, so what I want to do today is tell you about our efforts to understand how uh, HIV packages its genetic material. And um, this all started with my first grant proposal to the NIH in uh, 1989. And in that proposal, I said that I wanted to solve the structure of an 18 amino acid peptide. And actually I got the, a major NIH grant. Uh, at that time, a major grant was $70,000 a year, but uh, it was just to solve the structure of this 18 amino acid peptide. But the long-term goal I put in the proposal was to understand how HIV packages its genome. And the study section rightly told me that that was a highly ambitious goal for uh, NMR. But what I'm gonna show you is that we've actually been able to use NMR to look at larger and larger things, and in particular RNAs. And so because of those, um, relatively easy tricks that we've been using, uh, we, we think we are very close to really understanding how HIV selects its genome for packaging. And it does this from a cytoplasm that contains huge excesses of not only cellular RNAs, but spliced viral RNAs that don't get packaged. So here's a, uh, uh, a cartoon of the five prime leader of HIV. This is the untranslated part 
translation starts here at the gag initiation codon. <clears throat> and actually, this part of the viral genome is more conserved than the coding region. And the reason it's conserved is because this RNA has to regulate or direct a lot of different functions. And so one of the important functions that I'll be talking a little bit about is dimerization. The RNA has this conserved uh, palindrome that initially forms a, a kissing dimer as shown here. And uh, we think there's also a big rearrangement that occurs that leads to a more stable extended duplex structure. But the virus only packages its dimeric RNA. It doesn't package the monomeric form. And so we wanted to know early on what controls RNA dimerization. We put a lot of effort into this. This is something that's been studied uh, since, uh, well, before HIV was even known because other retroviruses also only package dimeric genomes. And if we make the dimeric HIV leader RNA in vitro by in vitro transcription, and uh, if it, it low salt, this, this is a monomer. And then if you put it in what we would call physiological like buffer over a period of time, the RNA equilibrium would shift to a dimer. And we know this is at equilibrium because if we take this sample and dilute it a hundredfold, the equilibrium shifts back to a monomer. And this is the way the HIV-1, uh, one of the very widely studied strains of HIV, the NL43 strain, this is how its five prime leader behaves. We wanted to know if this is a, a generic property of retroviruses, and we looked at the SIV leader, and even at much higher concentrations, we were not seeing dimers form. This really bothered us because we'd spent a lot of time, you know, 20 years studying this RNA, and we thought we had a good idea, good understanding of what controls this process. Uh, we looked at the secondary structure. Here's the proposed, one of the proposed secondary structures for the HIV leader. And I'm just drawing sort of freehand the, one of the proposed structures for the SIV leader. And we couldn't figure this out because they have a lot of similarities. But there was one difference that struck us. And that is that if you, you know, look at the sequence that's been deposited in the NIH database, this RNA starts with three Gs and this one only starts with two Gs. Now we had tried everything else. And so we eventually said, well, could this just be a consequence of the five prime end? Could one additional G be influencing this behavior? So we made the NL43 leader, the HIV leader that starts with one G, two G. And as soon as we added that extra G, the equilibrium that was favored uh, is the monomer rather than the dimer. And so this really surprised us. We, we then uh, remembered that all these RNAs are capped at the five prime end. And so uh, we were able to um, uh, get some vaccinia uh, virus capping enzyme and looked at what happens when you cap the, N uh, the RNA. So this would be the first base of the RNA, and this is reversed uh, uh, phosphotriester linked to a 7-methyl guanosine. So this would be the 7-methyl guanosine cap. And you can see that the cap 1G dimerizes like the 2G RNA, and then the cap 2G behaves more like the 3G RNA. And if you cap the 3G, it still remains a monomer. So 5 prime G number does influence dimerization and the cap seems to behave like an extra G. So we collaborate with a virologist at Michigan, Alice Tilsnitsky, and using some reagents that we were able to provide to her, she actually looked at the RNAs in vivo. And what she found is that the all three are actually made in infected cells and in transfected cells, but only the one G gets packaged into viruses and the 2G and 3G are actually, re, they re, remain in cells and they're, and they're enriched on polysomes. And that led to this new paradigm that we published just a few years ago that actually due to heterogeneous transcriptional start site usage, you get mainly the 1G and mainly the 3G. There's a little bit of uh, 2G that's made, but not a lot. So this is, this is similar to what's been widely studied as a twin start site usage. But both of these are made in cells, and the CAP3G RNA, we know in vitro, likes to be monomeric, and this is the form that functions as mRNA, and the CAP1G likes to form a dimer, and this is the form that gets packaged into virus. And it makes sense, because the one that likes to promote dimerization, um, we also know that the dimers are the ones that are packaged. So this seems to be a consistent story. Then that raises the question, how can inclusion of 1G out of 
out of you know 7,000 nucleotides, only a single guanosine have such a profound influence on structure. So we use NMR to try to figure this out. I just want to show you this is a one-dimensional NMR spectrum of the proton spectrum of this dimeric RNA. This is a 242 nucleotide dimer, so 750 nucleotides. And in order to actually try to understand the, the signals, we use uh, deuterium editing. And the reason we use this is if we try to use carbon editing or, or to a lesser extent, now nitrogen doesn't tend to be as helpful for assignment purposes, but we would like to do carbon, but the, the, there's a very strong proton carbon dipolar coupling that just completely wipes out the NMR spectrum when you put C13 into these RNAs, these large RNAs. So instead, we're just using a simple old method, two-dimensional nosy spectra, and this is a, if this is an even smaller RNA, this is a part of the HIV genome it's about 250 nucleotide region, and this is a fully protonated sample. So all of these bases and riboses are protonated. If we make a sample where we only have protons on the adenosine H2 and the ribose protons of the adenosine and guanosine, so we would call this A2R, so it means protons on H2 and ribose, and GR, the protons are on the guanosine ribose, we get really beautiful NMR spectra, and by making combinations of labeling, we can actually sort out the assignments of these large RNAs. So I wanna show you now data that we got for the capped 2G, and we also got this for the 3G. They, they give very similar spectra of one of the HIV leaders. And I'm just showing a region of the spectrum. This is an AH sample. So only the adenosines are protonated and all the other nucleotides are deuterated. So these are signals in this case from adenosine H2s to adenosine H1 primes. And we, we know the secondary structure because we can analyze these. But I want to focus on this adenosine right here because this is the predicted structure of this RNA. Um, and we added the extra G in this case. Now, this wasn't capped, but we just put the G on that mimics a cap for these experiments. And we wanted to look at this signal. So here's that adenosine A58 uh, seeing itself. So this is the H2 proton seeing its own H1 prime. If we make a sample where we have the adenosine H2 and ribose and cytosine ribose is protonated, because there's a cytosine that follows this, we would expect to see an NOE from this A to that C, and we see a nice NOE, just like we would expect. None of these have adenosine, have cytosines following them, so they don't see that same type of signal. If we make a sample where the, where the guanosines are riboses are protonated, now these others light up because they're, they're next to guanosines. But now this A58 also gives a weak signal to a guanosine. It doesn't look like these, it's much weaker. Now this should see a guanosine. If, you, if you've looked at NMR of RNA, you know that the H2 gives a good NOE to the following H1 prime and the cross strand I minus one H1 prime. But this H1 prime should be out here somewhere, not way back here and the intensity is weak. So it got us wondering whether this really was the NOE to that G. So Joshua Brown, an MD-PhD student in the lab, uh, figured out how he could make a sample where only protons, the protons are only on the first guanosine. And he did that by using in vitro transcription where he had protonated GMP and then an, an deuterated GTP. So the extension can only occur with deuterated guanosines. So this is the only G with a proton. He recollects the NMR spectrum and now you can see this A58 does give the NOE to the, to the G. Of course, none of these see a G because all these Gs are deuterated. And so this A58 is not close to this G, it's actually close to this G over here. And based on this kind of these kinds of experiments and using data I'm, I'm not gonna walk through now, we know that this does not form a hairpin as, as had been predicted. In fact, it's, lar it's largely unfolded. And the, this, this, what used to be a hairpin is now unwound and so that the residues that were part of a hairpin are now base paired at the bottom of this first hairpin. And this 7-methylguanosine is giving NOEs to lots of signals down here. And none of these give NOEs or chemical shifts consistent with a hairpin. So we were able to solve the structure of just a fragment just because we could work kind of quickly. And we know that this cap residue, and we did this with the capped RNA now, we, we were able to cap this and we can see that the cap is exposed, it's disordered, it's just kind of flopping around in solution. So that's for the form of the RNA that has uh, two or three Gs. Now we looked at the form of the RNA that has only one G plus a cap. And these are data now obtained for the capped RNA. 
because by this point we'd figured out how to efficiently get capping to work. And these are just different labeled samples and you can see the quality of the data. Now this is a, a larger RNA because this is a dimer, but still we're getting good quality data. We can't assign everything. Some parts are just too overlapped, but the arrows in the colored region show you what we were able to unambiguously assign using this deuterated method. So this method isn't allowing us to solve the 3D structure of the whole RNA, but we can probe regions of the RNA and sometimes pretty large regions you know, using this technique. One of the things that we saw was that this 7-methylguanosine seems to be stacked underneath this G, but it also gave good NOEs to this guanosine over here. Here I'm showing you these are data for the capped full-length RNA, and this is these are NOEs from the capped methyl group to its own H8 and to this G103H8 and also to the following H8. So what Josh did to try to solve a structure, we can't get the structure of the whole thing, he just made this fragment shown in dotted lines collected NMR data for that fragment, you can see that the cap signals overlap perfectly with these signals. Of course, he could go to higher concentration and lots of different labeling schemes. And with that, he was able to solve the structure of this region of the dimeric RNA. And what he saw is that these hairpins do form. So unlike the RNA that had more Gs, where this was unwound, when you only have one G in a cap, this stays a hairpin, but now you can see that the tar hairpin in brown is stacked end to end with this hairpin in cyan. And now the cap you can see is sequestered. It's hidden away, it's not exposed. So what we concluded from this is that transcriptional start site heterogeneity actually expands the functional output of a single integrated proviral DNA. So if the RNA is made with um, a couple of G, uh, you know, a couple of Gs or an extra G, then uh, you end up with this cap that's exposed. These extra base pairs unwind. There's some remodeling that goes on here. This is a completely remodeled RNA, and the five prime cap is exposed. And we thought that this structure might promote splicing and translation. But when there's only a single G with a cap, you can see these hairpins stack end to end. And this has a different structure now. Here, the dimer-promoting residues are base paired, and it doesn't dimerize. Now they're exposed to promote dimerization. And we show that this form of the RNA has lots of HIV protein binding sites, whereas this doesn't. This only has a few. And we think that's why this form of the RNA is selectively packaged. So this supports this idea by an NIH uh, 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 scientist, Judith Levin, and her co-workers from 76, when I was still in high school, uh, which where she found that these that some retrovirus, of course, this is an HIV at the time, but they, they, their RNAs exist in non-interconverting pools, the RNAs that are translated versus the RNAs that are packaged. But we don't think this is quite the end of the story. And we got a little bit worried because, you know, here's the, the full-length dimeric RNA that has only one G, and our colleagues developed a much more sensitive assay for measuring packaging. What they do is they co-transfect cells with, so that with plasmids that make RNAs that contain the native leader, so this native leader, and transcripts that contain a modified leader. Now, in this case, the test RNA contains the same as the wild type. So they're both transfected at similar levels in cells. And now here's what gets into virus. You can see if the test RNA has the same leader as the wild type leader, they both are equally packaged into virus. It's a competitive packaging assay. And then what we showed, as we expected from all our earlier NMR work and other work, is that if we cut off residues important for reverse transcription, uh, that we, we, we can make these in cells, and, and, or Alice can, Alice and Sergey, her postdoc, and this RNA gets packaged into virus just as well as the wild type. So this works really well. Now, we also made what we call the core encapsidation signal. This is the RNA that's missing tar and poly A. And in earlier work that did not involve a competitive packaging assay, this was packaged just fine into viruses. And we did a lot of work on this. We, have, we even have a paper in science where we solve the structure of this part of the RNA, and we know what it looks like. We know it has all the protein binding sites that are needed for packaging. We know it dimerizes just like the wild type leader. And we looked at this, and look at this, it's not packaged at all. And this was a result that really started to worry us because we've we put a lot of effort into this. Why isn't this package? This RNA contains all the high affinity protein binding sites that are needed for packaging. All the binding sites that are in here 
are also in here. It dimerizes just like the wild type leader. It folds based on NMR, as far as we can tell, all the signals that we see here match up with signals that we see in here, folds like the native leader. Why isn't it packaged in this competitive asset? And finally, we realize that, hey, this RNA, when, when it's made in cells, it's gonna be capped, right? Could capped exposure prevent the packaging of this RNA that otherwise should be packaged? And so what we did is we made this, this native RNA with the cap, and we showed if you add EIF4E, which is a cap-binding protein, it doesn't bind. If we make the RNA that's missing the, the, this, this other loop on the top that we know is not important for packaging, but still has tar and poly A, and it's capped in vitro, it doesn't bind the cap binding protein. But now, if, and if we make tar and poly A by itself, just this cassette of two hairpins that's capped, it does not bind. So this is very efficient at preventing cap binding protein from binding to the cap. But now if we make our core encapsidation signal that has a cap stuck on the end, this RNA, which is a dimer, binds two molecules of cap binding protein. So this is able in vitro to bind to the cap, and then we did the in vivo experiments that, that sort of support this. So the first thing we did is made the whole leader, just extended it by a few residues. So in, and then made this uh, in NMR and the NMR spectrum match up really nicely with the native RNA that doesn't have this extension. Uh, it forms a dimer, just like the wild type leader. It binds all the viral uh, uh, nucleocapsid proteins, the proteins that are important for packaging, it binds them just like the wild type leader. The only difference is that this RNA binds the cap binding protein, whereas the native leader does not. And now if you look at what happens in cells, here's this RNA, it's made at about equal molar amounts in cells and it's not packaged at all. So cap exposure is inhibiting packaging of the otherwise native leader. Now, what about cap removal? What if we remove cap from the cap in core encapsidation signal? So this was a really cool experiment that was engineered by Pumfei Ding, who's a, a postdoc in the lab right now. He put in a ribozyme, uh, engineered that into the ends of our core encapsidation signal. And others had shown that this ribozyme is uh, co-transcriptionally cleaved, auto, you know, auto-cleaved at this point, which would remove the cap. And then he made a mutant that has been shown to prevent this cleavage. So the mutant would have a cap and the, and the native ribozyme would not have the cap on the end. And here they are, here's the native leader. It's packaged just like it should be. Here's our, our modified RNA that now has cap removed because it enzymatically gets cut off. It's packaged just as well as the native leader. So cutting off the cap gets allows this RNA to direct packaging just as well as wild type. And the mutant that is unable to eliminate the cap is, is no longer packaged. And so we now know that this is the, the authentic packaging signal, phew, right? I mean, we were really starting to worry that the tar poly A hairpins actually indirectly promote packaging by structurally sequestering the cap. And we think that here, here's a mechanism that might explain this, that in the nucleus, you know, the RNAs that have the extra Gs have an exposed cap, cap binding protein can bind, and that this capture is, is necessary then for splicing or for, or for um, translation once this gets out to the ribosome. These, this EIF4E is essential for those processes. But the RNAs that have only one G, those caps would be sequestered. So it would evade capture by this RNA processing and translation machinery. And now this RNA could be captured by the viral proteins that, that encode for packaging. So with that, I just want to acknowledge the people that did the work. All the early work on, done that, that identified this core encapsidation signal was done by Xiao and Sarah. Uh, Sarah Monti and Tao are the ones that originally discovered that these extra Gs really do make a difference in dimerization. And that led to this whole uh, area. So again, this was just doing some very basic, simple, one-dimensional NMR studies on these different large RNAs that led to these new insights. And then the uh, the work on the the structural work on the capped RNA was done by Joshua Brown. He now has his MD PhD. He wants to be a physician scientist. He's at Emory doing his residency. And Peng Fei is the person who's done the really cool work on the. Um, the, the uh, eliminating the cap and showing that cap sequestration is, in, is important for packaging. Thank you. Thanks for this uh, fabulous uh, talk, uh, Mike. It's absolutely stunning to see how much you can do 
with some perseverance and some extensive deterioration. Uh, for us, uh, protein jocks, um, can you sort of like give us a little bit more uh, insight into how much work is it to, to label uh, nucleic acids, RNA in particular, compared to proteins? Yeah, well, the, the kind of labeling that we do is uh, really pretty trivial. Um, it's expensive. So Jamie Williamson has figured out a way to enzymatically make uh, different deuterated NTPs. And he started a company and, they, and CIL provides these. So um, occasionally there's some new labeling scheme we're really interested in and we'll talk to Jamie and they'll figure out how to make it. But in general, the things we use all the time, like you know, where we have protons on the riboses but no protons on the aromatic bases, that, that tends to be really important because all of our information is really coming from that aromatic region of the spectrum. You know, we have, a, we have a clump of signals for the riboses in the aromatic region. We don't have all that nice dispersion that you have with proteins. So, um, so really it's, it's just using very simple in vitro transcription and then buying these NTPs. Uh, you know, it can maybe cost, you know, $800, $1,200 per RNA sample that we wanna look at. And because we have to make lots of different labeled samples, the, the cost can kind of go up that way. Um, now, uh, a, a disadvantage is that with this approach is you're labeling everything. Every adenosine is labeled the same way. Uh, but I can tell you that people are working on ways of putting the labels in. And a former student of mine, Victoria D'Souza at Harvard, has come up with this phenomenal way. I think she's going to be uh, presenting it soon, a way of, of making the RNA in segments and, and doing this in one pot, and it seems to work really, really well. So now you'd be able to have one labeling scheme on one part of the RNA and a different labeling scheme on a different part. In fact, you could have everything deuterated, but have a pro protons only on one residue in the middle of the RNA. Now, you, we're not making artificially artificial nucleotides this way. This has to be a, a, a normal nucleotide, I think, because she may have figured that out too. But in general, uh, the, that's kind of the strength and limitation. The strength is it's easy to do to make these labeled RNAs. The limitation is with the current published technology is um, all like nucleotides are labeled the same way. Right. Well, it's impressive to see what you've been able to do with it. Uh, questions from the audience. Uh, first question is, how does RNA Paul make heterogeneous five prime end? Yeah, so um, we're not exactly sure, but there's a whole field that studies this. So this is Paul II. And so uh, Paul II, uh, even with cellular RNAs, sometimes has uh, ends up with heterogeneous start sites. And so it's actually really interesting because there are certain genes that are known to have this twin start site mechanism. There's quite a few genes that do this, where they start either with the first G. So the, the, the DNA has three Gs in a row, and it's not really clear, uh, clear at the boundary which one would be used. That's why it was so confusing to us, because if you go and look in the HIV database that's, that the NIH has, um, well, it's, 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 a national, it's an international database, people would do DNA sequences, but then you predict the RNA structure based on the DNA. Well, nobody knew what the start site was. And so people were just kind of guessing. That's why the, the SIV sequence, we said it starts with 3G, but it, it also uses a, uh, a heterogeneous mechanism. So um, this twinned mechanism is pretty common. And there are certain genes that in one cell type predominantly use one start site and in a different cell type use the other start site. And so that tells us that there must be something in those cells that's controlling which site is predominantly used. And that raises even the possibility that HIV might use one site initially because it wants to make all the accessory proteins that it needs to prepare a cell to make virus. And then maybe something changes in the cells that allow that, that lead to a shift in start site usage. We don't know. It's kind of a cool idea we're thinking about. Um, but this, but the point is that this isn't something that HIV uses, uh, you know, uh, on its own. This is something that's co-opted that that cells do normally. All right. Uh, another uh, question here from uh, uh, Jim Prestigard. He starts off by saying, "Nice work, Mike." Means uh, you got to be careful now because now comes the question. 
Uh, I vaguely remember more than 50 years ago that some protons on nucleic acids slowly exchange with protons in water, like HA of adenine, uh, perhaps. Uh, do you use this for labeling and can the rates be used to get some structural information? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Um, so uh, if one of the ways that we can keep our costs down is to deuterate the uh, H8 protons on the guanosines and the adenosines. And there's uh, published tricks for doing that. Basically, guanosines exchange occurs pretty quickly. So if we, if we, if we put the uh, ATP in the right solution, then uh, it's, a, it's a very basic solution. Overnight, all the H8s will exchange with deuterium if we have it in you know, D2O in the, under this, with this particular base. And I don't remember what it is right now. It's some, some amine, I, I forgot what it is. Uh, adenosines take longer. They, those you need to incubate for several days. Um, but it, is, it can be a problem because maybe we wanna see those protons. And if the RNA is sitting around in solution at near neutral pH, over time, you're right, those, uh, those proton signals for the H8s will slowly start to get weaker and weaker as they're exchanging with D2O, with the deuterium in the D2O. So uh, yeah, Jim, we do use, um, we take advantage of that when we want to, and we have to be a little bit careful about older samples where those signals are getting weaker. All right, uh, last question here, or I think it's the last, no, two more questions. Um, one from Gerhard Wagner, he says, again, great talk. Uh, learning that only part of the RNAs bind uh, EIF4E in the nucleus. Uh, does it mean that only part of the mRNAs are exported uh, from the yeah. nucleus? So normally the, uh, the only RNAs that would normally be exported are those that are fully spliced. So cells have machinery to try to, to prevent the export of unspliced RNAs. HIV makes an accessory protein called REV. And so the, the spliced RNAs get out. One of the spliced RNAs makes this REV accessory protein. REV actually has a nuclear import signal that goes in and then REV assembles on the unspliced RNA and assists with the export or allows the export. And I'm pretty sure it's a creme dependent export of the unspliced RNA. So HIV has to package its unspliced RNA. So, um, so it, you know, it's not just as simple as hiding the cap is all you need because you've got to hide the cap in order to prevent capture by the splicing machinery, but then you still have to have these accessory proteins in order to get that RNA out of the nucleus. Thank you. Um, maybe last question here. Um, uh, Walter Chazen, he says, uh, Mike, thanks for the latest update of your uh, beautiful work. Uh, any evidence of post-translational modifications uh, that could alter the G start site? Yeah, so um, I don't know. Uh, there, there are there are papers that have that we are starting to look at where people have looked at decapping enzymes in the cytoplasm and how they may play a role in certain cellular gene function. Um, and then, of course, there's also uh, people are now looking at. Um, this is a post-transcriptional modification of RNAs in the cytoplasm. So maybe, you know, methylated adenosines and what role could they play? At this point, we haven't looked at those possibilities. They may be important or not, we don't know. We, right now, we haven't um, carefully screened RNAs. Now, there are people have, who have looked at viral RNAs for post-transcriptional modifications. And I think they tend to be, uh, the RNAs, the, these sites, they are found. The RNAs are post-transcriptionally modified. But from my understanding, they are, they're sort of scattered throughout the RNA and they're at very low levels. And so whether they're really playing a role or not in the viral life cycle, I don't know. But that's an, that's an important area that people need to still explore. All right. Well, thanks very much for this incredible presentation. Fantastic to see it and how much can be done with a little bit of perseverance. Awesome. Thank you. The, uh, Marcus, you're ready to take it over for the, the next talk. So Hello. I'm uh, introducing uh, Professor Jun Xiaolu next. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to have uh, Jun Xiaolu with us today from Shanghai Tech. Um, so just a little background, Jun Xiao obtained her undergraduate degree from Fudan University in Shanghai in 2002 
Uh, and then she moved to the US and joined uh, Gary Lorigan's lab in Miami University in, in, uh, in Ohio uh, and studied um, uh, membrane peptides uh, such as antimicrobial peptides and phospholamban using oriented membrane solid state NMR techniques. Um, and uh, uh, then in 2007, she moved to NIH and joined Rob Tico's lab. In the next few years, she um, transitioned from studying membrane peptides and proteins, such as HIV DPU, uh, to amyloid proteins. Uh, and uh, in 2013, she uh, published a groundbreaking study uh, to uh, determine the structure of A beta fibrils that are seeded or amplified from Alzheimer's uh, disease brain. Uh, this uh, 2013 cell paper showed that the, the um, brain seeded A beta fibro has a different structure, has a monomorphic threefold uh, structure, different structure from the in vitro A beta fibros known uh, until then. Um, in 2015, she returned back to Shanghai and started her own group in Shanghai Tech. And since then has taken her research to interesting new directions uh, looking at uh, amyloid forming protein kinases involved in program cell death. That's what she's going to tell us today, uh, as well as uh, um, a neurodegenerative amyloid protein such as uh, TDP43, as well as some uh, peptides or proteins involved in enamel uh, mineral formation. Uh, so um, I'm very interested in hearing uh, your latest uh, result. Uh, Junxia, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, May, for the nice introduction. And uh, I will share my uh, slides. And also, it's really a great honor for me to be able to have this opportunity. And I want to thank uh, all the committee um, for giving me this opportunity. So today, I'm going to uh, tell you my um, recently published work on the amyloid structure of RIPK3. Uh, of mouse and a human in cell necroptosis. And this protein is also called the receptor interacting protein kinase 3. Um, so before I tell you my experiment results, I want to give you an introduction on the cell necroptosis. As May said, it's a programmed cell death, but it's different from apoptosis. So it's a severe cell death that can cause body inflammation. And there are many pathways that can induce uh, necroptosis, but uh, no matter how different these pathways are, and finally they um, converge to this center point, that is RIPK3 um, oligomer forms. Only when it is formed, um, it will phosphorylate itself because it's a kinase, and also it will phosphorylate the downstream protein, MLKL, make it oligomerize, then and, and the, the structure will change and then it go, will translocate to the membrane to disrupt the membrane cause the cell death. And also, this is not the first time in this webinar we talk about necroptosis. About a, a year ago, Dr. M. McDermott has actually told us the um, um, groundbreaking work on the uh, amyloid structure of RIPK1 and RIPK3 uh, heteroamyloid. And this uh, amyloid actually is the intermediate that's formed in the first pathway that is used uh, that the TNF and other factor induced necroptosis. Well, this intermediate is believed to act as a template to recruit more RIPK3 protein uh, that is free in the cell, go to this uh, um, oligomer. So finally induce the RIPK3 uh, homo oligomer formation. And this is their uh, solid state NMR structure where RIPK1 and K3 form this um, in register um, parallel bed sheet structure. Then two layers of this bed sheet structure arranged in an anti parallel way form this kind of fiber. But it is reported that. Uh, RIPK1, RIPK3 hydroamyloid cannot directly induce MLKL phosphorylation and uh, its structure transformation. So from this step, it can not directly go to this step. And uh, HOMO, RIPK3 oligomer has to form. That's why this structure is very important and we decide to study it. And another term I want to introduce you is dream domain. Uh, it's also called a dripper homo 
typical interaction motive. So um, it's a, a sequence about 10 to 20 radio long, but it's most important uh, uh, sequence is this conserved four residues in the middle, which has the Q as the, uh, the second residue and the glycine is the fourth residue. The first and the third residue uh, uh, is always uh, hydrophobic residue as leucine, valine, and uh, leucine. And there are many proteins actually have this terrain domain. You can see here those protein with red tag. Uh, so many proteins involved in this, in this necroptic signal transduction and amplification has this terrain domain. Not only this, uh, like uh, uh, here, the hat S protein also have this rain domain. And the head has protein actually has the similar function, regulate a kind of cell death in the yeast. And also some virus also have it. The rain domain is actually uh, uh, the, the segment that's responsible for this protein-protein interaction that causes this oligomerization. And therefore my student actually started by cloning the C-term domain of uh, uh, RIPK3, which include um, the RIM segment. So for human and the mouse, for human it's about 100 residues and for mouse it's 77 residues. So the protein c terminal domain can assemble uh, into uh, this kind of oligomer structure. And, and uh, the TM image shows here, uh, where we can see mouse RIPK3 um, uh, oligomer seems uh, looks uh, more homogeneously. And we also uh, did XRD, X3 diffraction on these two samples, and both of them uh, show these two diffraction rings at 9.7 astron and 4.7 astron. And uh, therefore, the, it is consistent uh, um, that those uh, uh, assemblies are fiber-like structure, amyloid-like structure. Now we use the uniform labeled protein and to obtain the solid state and the mass spectra. Um, we found that the, um, the resolution is good. And so we can do the assignment. And finally, we uh, combine all these spectra. Uh, we conclude that there are only 20 residues actually contribute to the signals. And the other part are flexible domains. So there's no solid state and mass signal from um, chemical shift and the tallest um, and prediction, there are three bad strands, um, basically. And it's also consistent with the sequence, uh, just pure sequence prediction, use PSI spread. Mm. We also did a dark field a TM um, to study whether um, uh, how many um, protofilaments are there in the fiber. Then from this, uh, um, the image, the bright list of the fiber, uh, we can compare it to this TMV and the standard um, image. Then we conclude the mass per length value for the um, rib cave fiber is uh, about 18 kilodalton. It's a little bit less than uh, like if one proto fiber in, in, is in the fiber, it's supposed to be 20 kilodalton per nanometer. But considering the, the arrow, so we think there are only one proto filament in the mature fiber. Then we also use solid state and amount to um, figure out it is a parallel bed sheet uh, structure. And there are many ways to do that. Uh, you can um, label one part of a sample, um, pure ni nitrogen label, then the other is carbon 13 label and the see the nitrogen carbon um, correlation spectra. Then we found that that way is uh, very difficult and uh, the signal is hard to get. So we have to freeze the sample. But by learning from this paper, uh, we finally designed, a, uh, we also use this, uh, just the carbon-carbon 2D correlation and uh, use the two glycerol label the sample because the two glycerol label sample, uh, um, actually very, in this sample, very few residues can be carbon-13 uh, labeled at uh, alpha carbon beta carbon simultaneously. There's only valine, isoleucine, and serine. You can see their signals. But if you increase the mixing time to 500 milliseconds, then you can see longer um, uh, distance, longer contact. 
And for this type of residue, aspartame, glutamine, and the residue, the two glycerol label can make the residue sometimes see alpha label, sometimes see beta label, but not in the same residue. So we can see in this spectra, this uh, this um, residue correlation peaks, and these peaks only come from the intermolecular uh, interaction, so which indicates those residue in in the space they are very close, and then it is um, the only possible way is they are in register parallel bed sheet um, this conformation. So basically, we this is a, um, there are many there are not many peaks, and uh, also the resolution is okay. We get our um, contact information mainly from the dye spectra with different mixing time and with TDO or nitrogen carbon correlation spectra and using the uniform labeled sample and the glycerol labeled sample. Here I'll show you one example um, that is the uh, human repetition 3 fiber uniform labeled sample, the 500 millisecond carbon mixing, carbon 2D. And there we can see this green color, the residue. Uh, the 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 peaks is a co um, is from the correlation between uh, sequentially connected residues, and those blue color labeled the uh, peaks are from residues that in the sequence that is a uh, little bit far. And so finally, use export NIH, we can actually calculate the uh, the two structure human repetition three fiber and the mouse. Uh, here I only show you the monomer structure for clarity. Basically, they are similar with three bad strands here, here, and here. And the, the central rim, uh, central tetrad is the second bad strand, as always. And they also have difference. So if we align this central tetrad strand, we can see for mouse replicate three fibers, the last strand is a little bit far from the center. And for human repository fiber, we also have fine EM evidence. But, and this structure is obtained from Dr. Liu Chong's lab at the Shanghai um, Institute of Organic Chemistry. Then we also obtained a carbon carbon 2D spectra uh, using their prime EM sample. The, compared to our solid state and my sample, we see the spectra overlaid very well. So the, uh, the actually, and the both structure the, are indeed the same structure. Although they are, for their con contract, construct, uh, the sequence is a little bit longer and the preparation method is uh, different, a slightly different method. Mm. Then we confirmed that the repetition three fiber would have three bad strands, but uh, how important are these bad strands? And from previous uh, research, we know the rim central uh, bad strand is very important. Then we want to test if other part are also important. Then my collaborator, Dr. Wang Huayi from the same institute, the Shanghai Tech University, he proposed the following uh, functional study at the cell level. And they also did the, uh, so they did this uh, um, mutation studies. First, uh, they choose this uh, um, single site mutation, they choose the Size in the middle of each bed strand that is here, um, 442 and uh, 449456 to D as particle acid. It's a big change. Then also to A, so there's a, conserv um, a little bit more conserv conservative change. Then also he um, did uh, the segment replacement, replace the first bed strand the second and the third best strand to AAAA, uh, those sequence. Then use this NH3T3 cell, and um, it can test the cell uh, necroptosis. So using a combination of three drugs, TSZ, the three drugs, um, the cell would uh, um, um, be induced to, uh, to the death. You can see here, using the wild type um, uh, RIPK3, um, um, this is a white type cell, and the cell actually uh, upon induction, only uh, less than 40% cell survived. But for mutation, the change is significant, and the cell death is totally blocked. And for this group of mutation, the change um, we still can see, but not so significant. And uh, 
um, besides that, he also did uh, some study on the protein protein interaction and the cell level use SEK cell. Well, um, the cell express both uh, RIPK1 and RIPK3 proteins. But for RIPK3 protein, it uh, has an extra flag tag. Use flag IP and they pull down the RIPK3 fragment. So if the protein protein interaction still exists, they will also pull down RIPK1 protein. Then from the gel, we can see that it is the case for the Y type and the three uh, single site mutation. But for the segment, uh, replacement, uh, this interaction was totally um, um, abolished. And for the uh, single side mutation, we see they are still form fiber in vitro. And, but the, uh, the fiber forming kinetics changed. We use the THT for instance um, to detect it. We can see this the red color is the white type of protein. The fiber grows um, quickly and then go to the um, this uh, uh, flat stage, but the other built and the fiber actually is, is different. And we also did an NMR on two of the built and here shows in green and blue. Um, you can see uh, some peak remained, but uh, there are also peak missing and also position changed. And one position I want to mention is here is for isolucine 450. Uh, it's, uh, it's here. So this, this is the residue near to Q449. And um, you can see for green and blue mutation, um, all of them, both of them changed to this position. For the green color mutation, it's uh, ex actually close to I450. So it makes sense. It makes sense the chemical shift of I450 changed. But for this blue color mutation, it's a little bit far. But still, it can cause similar change. It tells us the three bed strands are actually indeed very important. Uh, there are close interaction between each other. And um, as we come to the end, uh, then we came to this uh, heteroamyloid structure with our homoamyloid structure. We see there are uh, differences. So how can we explain this? Then we come up uh, to this uh, method, and it is done by and Charles from NIH, he helped us a lot in that. So we have this, uh, um, this idea that using this homo amyloid as a model, we replace half of the peptide here to RIPK1. So we made a hypothetic um, hetero amyloid model. Then we run a MD equilibrium um, relaxation run for 50 picosecond. And during that time, we find that for the homo amyloid, it didn't change much in the structure. It only developed a left hand twist. Uh, you can see it's actually um, um, the structure even tighter than this one here. But for the hypothetical um, hetero amyloid, and they developed the opening of the conformation between the first bad strand and the second bad strand. Then by looking at this conformation and compared to this um, solid state and mass structure, uh, if you just look at one, one layer, you will see they are actually uh, very similar. So then we came up with uh, uh, this idea, we propose this mechanism. That is um, for the first uh, uh, pathway, the necroptosis uh, pathway. Uh, once this heteroamyloid formed, and then more RIPK3 come in, attach itself to the end. Then because th there's only RIPK3 come in. So uh, with the time, it becomes more and more like RIPK3 fiber. As RIPK3 fiber, the more stable structure is like this. And so slowly it's actually break up and uh, um, tight itself. So this is just an idea. Um, and before I finish, I want to mention another thing is about a fiber twist. Um, as you know, for solid state and MR, we cannot get this information, but we all know the fiber will develop twist. Uh, as I mentioned, if we do the uh, relaxation uh, simulation, then the, the, actually it, the fiber will develop this twist. And uh, in our case, it's a left-handed twist with uh, 6.5 angle, that is the angle between 
the neighboring peptide. Then we know if you do a EM, very a good EM, a good quality image, you can see this twist. Of course, if you have a quiet EM data, you will get the twist. Then we from Dr. Liu's lab, uh, Liu Chong's lab, he tell us if you do add them very well, if the image quality is good, you can see actually the pitch. So that is uh, uh, the fiber turns uh, a circle. Then from that, you can also calculate the twist angle is about six degree for our case mouse uh, rib case ray fiber. And so, um, and furthermore, uh, Dr. Liu's lab even surveyed uh, um, all the fiber structures that is, that's published using cry yen because um, there they can get this pitch value clearly and then and they put this uh, figure and with x uh, y axis is a number of residues in the fiber core you can see it kind of has a relationship with rib k3 fiber it's at the edge uh, with, uh, which has uh, the smallest pitch and the, uh, it's the smallest uh, fiber core. So uh, the data suggests that a high twist, high, uh, short pitch, which means favors the fibers with a small fiber core. So that's uh, um, probably all the data I have for published data. Then continuously, uh, I will end with this, that uh, um, um, our lab is still uh, studying proteins in this pathway and also um, we are studying this DAI and this, this protein has two uh, RIM domains and uh, like head has but uh, we our recent result is only one RIM domain actually involved in the fiber formation the other one is not uh, uh, playing any role here and also we found that for mouse rib k1 it, uh, the fiber can develop this kind of Hexagon pattern, and uh, we're also trying to figure out ways to um, get the contact information, and that's uh, actually very difficult. So, uh, what makes this uh, hexagon, hexagon um, pattern? What's the special interaction there? And so, uh, I, I don't show the data here, but uh, and, uh, with the time limits, and I will. Uh, stop here and I want to thank my uh, students in the lab, uh, especially Wu Xialian, who did uh, all of the work uh, in solid state and MAR. Then uh, from the, um, Hu Hong from Dr. Wang's lab did the functional study in the cell. And of course, Charles helped us a lot in the calculation. And uh, Dr. Liu's lab provides this crime EM data and, uh, and, talk, and told us about the AFM. And also, I want to um, help um, thank uh, on the, all the facilities at the Shanghai Tech University, especially Dr. Wang Jian, our NMR facility manager, who provides us a lot of technical help. And uh, most important, I want to thank my um, postdoc advisor, Rob Tico. Actually, uh, all these things here, he taught me. Uh, without him, I'm, I'm not going to able to achieve all this. And thank you all. Thank you, Jusha, for a very nice talk. Yeah, so yeah. Um, while we wait for questions, maybe from the audience come up, let me start. Okay, so there's a few more slides. Um, so uh, from your very nice uh, S-shaped structures, uh, structure, mm -hmm. uh, um, well, the two structures, right? Human and mouse, yeah. uh, RIPK3. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any insight as to the side chain interactions that stabilize this S shape. Uh, so if I look at your central strand, it faces mm -hmm. you know, two strands, neighboring strands. Are there steric yeah. zippers on both sides or uh, is any, uh, this one top side looks a little looser. So maybe there's no particular stabilizing interactions. Just, I'm wondering if you have any insight about what holds the structure together into this S shape or maybe you call it the N shape, whichever one you want. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, there are side chain interactions I didn't show here and from our NMR, um, um, carbon carbon 2D, we can see, um, for example, here the L4456 to Q449, uh, and also there are also very high, uh, it's actually tightly packed here with all the hydrophobic residues. Uh, we can observe uh, 
um, these um, interactions in an animal. Um, so uh, they are actually tightly packed. Even for this one, you see, it seems very loose. I also um, have some doubt on that why it is so loose, why it didn't go up there. But this is the, uh, the calculation told us. We indeed see a lot of contacts here, but, um, but probably we don't see here. That's why it didn't, the calculation didn't make it go mm -hmm. up there. But for human, we also observe some at the end of this uh, um, uh, strand. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. Then for the, so if, if you can see the two layer of this uh, um, peptide, there are also many uh, side chain contact because we have a lot of uh, asparagine and this Q residues, the side yeah. chain actually uh -huh. forms the hydrogen bonding. Yeah. And so besides the backbone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking about, you know, comparison or difference from neurodegenerative uh, amyloids, our larger ones like a tau protein. And there, I don't think, or I'm not strongly aware of uh, structures where you have both sides of the beta strand um, forming steric zippers. Um, I think mm -hmm. AD Alzheimer's tau fold, it's a C-shape. So a strand really yeah. just has a steric zipper to one side. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe there are now more folds where something like your three layered uh, structures uh, or even four layers. Yeah. 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 So in this case, actually, I, uh, I didn't tell this part, this slides here. And um, that is as head as a structure. Okay. So, yeah. So before, um, so this paper, then after we do, we finish our data writing this, uh, our paper, we find, we came across this paper. Actually, they did a prediction um, mm -hmm. based on head as. Uh, structure, the RIP1, RIP3 structure. So it also looks like that. Also, finally, it's, there's a little bit difference at the residue level, but they have this kind of S shape. And okay. um, yeah, the, if you see the head S structure, so they have this two, uh, this, this one static zipper, but the last one kind of goes away. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 So, okay. Uh, so that there might be differences between functional amyloids and neurodegenerative mm -hmm. amyloids. Right. So mm -hmm. um, I see there are two questions in the, from the audience. So Ratiko asked, how does the spacing uh, between interfibrillar contacts in the hexagonal mesh assemblies mm -hmm. uh, compare with the twist um, period? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rob. This is a good uh, a question. I also suspect that because of their periodicity, um, has to, there's nothing else can make it uh, um, like that. So um, it has to have some curiosity in the structure that make this kind of thing. Then probably it's the, the twist of the fiber because the, the actual, the weight and the length of each pentagon, the, um, it's uh, about 23 nanometer. It's very close to uh, the pitch value. And, um, but it's for different uh, fiber, right? This is MK, uh, K1, and uh, our pitch value is all from RIPK3. So we, uh, we are trying to get the pitch value for this fiber, but we have to make a way to make it uh, uh, disassemble, to make it uh, like a straight fiber, then we can see. At this moment, um, if all are together, we couldn't really find a good um, technique to observe. The AFM, if you look at it, it's all, all together. I couldn't um, tell. And then the TEM is also, um, it's difficult. So I, I, I'm asking students to find a way to disassemble this hexagon. And, but still there are, there are fibers. Then from there, we can see if uh, it can tell us some information on the twist, then if it matches with the um, hexagon pattern. Good. Um, so Grace uh, Royapa uh, asked, uh, do these fibros cooperatively interact with uh, MLKL oligomers? Um, where are they in cells? Yeah. Um, uh, this, I, I really am not sure about that if they interact with MLKL, but um, we didn't do um, this in-cell uh, study using this fiber. And actually, and I also just learned all this 
the, all this in cell study. For example, here, they, they can only do a, a, like test only one step. Like this cell, so they, they have this protein, but the protein has a tag here. Actually, the, the function of the drug is, is to induce the protein to oligomerize. And they found only the protein oligomerize, um, it will um, go through the cell death. So they have to somehow interact with MLK. Um, and then the cell will die. And so, but it didn't have the, uh, the front step uh, and for the, so for the necroptosis, you have a lot of steps here, right? And so basically they, they skipped all this step. They start with here. They find a way to uh, induce it to oligomerize and then go here. Then that's why they have to do another uh, study just purely to investigate the protein protein interaction here. And um, so from the cell, of course, they will have interaction with uh, MLKL, but it's not our our protein. Right? This this is a protein we did we made in vitro. Um, uh, there's no ev evidence that we can make it. Uh, um, we didn't do anything actually use the in vitro fiber to induce the cell um, to die. Um, so there's a gap here. That's, um, okay, I hope I can explain these things well. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I think uh, we're pretty pretty well on time and uh, um, we invite the audience members to stay on for more questions. Uh, if you if you like to talk to the speakers. Uh, thank you, Junxia, for a very nice mm -hmm. talk. And thank so you.